Hello, everyone. My name is Hugh Ellenwood. I'm the Archives Manager at the White Rock Museum and Archives. Welcome to another White Rock Museum and Archives video presentation. Today's video is Remembrance Day in White Rock. Remembrance Day is sometimes mistakenly thought of as a celebration of war and military victories. But really, Remembrance Day is a commemoration of the sacrifices made by ordinary people who did extraordinary things during times of extreme crisis. In this video, I'm going to tell you some of the stories of those ordinary people from White Rock. Over the century since the end of the First World War, Remembrance Day has evolved to include Canadian veterans of all subsequent wars and peacekeeping missions, from the Russian Revolution to the struggle against Daesh in Iraq and Syria. And we also remember Canadian veterans from earlier conflicts, such as the Boer War. The Second Boer War has the distinction of being Canada's first official dispatch of troops to an overseas war. It was fought from 1899 to 1902. The last two years of the war were a vicious guerrilla war between the South African Constabulary and Boer guerrillas. This is Nelson Henry in the uniform of the South African Constabulary, wearing the Queen's South Africa medal. He was born in 1873 in Muncie, Ontario, a member of the Chippewa First Nation. He joined the military in Brandon, Manitoba in 1889. By the time of the creation of the constabulary in 1900, he would have been quite an experienced soldier. The two clasps on his medal indicate a level of experience as well. As a member of the constabulary, Nelson would probably have been engaged in long, tiring patrols searching for Boer guerrillas over the South African countryside. After his time in South Africa, Nelson returned to Canada and became a blacksmith and a harness maker. He and his family moved to White Rock in 1911. It was a large family of four boys, three of whom would go to war themselves in the 1940s. Nelson worked as a millwright at the Campbell River Lumber Company until 1929. He passed away in 1952, and his descendants still live in White Rock today. George Ives was born in England in 1881 and joined the British Army at the time of the Boer War. He had some hair-raising stories to tell about the guerrilla war in South Africa, including going on a patrol with over a hundred men and coming back with only 17 left alive. He recounted run-and-gun battles over the countryside, chasing guerrillas into the hills and rounding up women and children into camps. It was a very savage war. But George survived, and later, at the outbreak of the First World War, he was actually too old to join up. He immigrated to Canada in 1903 and came to White Rock in 1958, where he spent the rest of his life. In 1992, he met Canada's Governor General Ray Natitian at White Rock's coat of arms dedication ceremony. At the time, George was 111 years old, the oldest man in Canada and the only surviving veteran of the Boer War in the world. William Barge, another White Rock veteran of the Boer War, was a fishmonger and had a shop right across Marine Drive from the station just before the First World War. When the war broke out, he and his two sons, Earl on the left and Bill Jr., all joined up. Bill Sr. was in France before his sons, perhaps because he already had military experience. He was with a supply unit handling mules and wagons, but he had to be invalided home in 1915 when he contracted blood poisoning. Earl was wounded at Vimy Ridge, taking two bullets in the leg on March 8, 1917, about a month before the beginning of the Canadian offensive there. Bill Jr. was a signaller and was awarded the Military Medal for keeping communications open under heavy fire, for which he received high praise from his commanding officer in 1917. All three barges were wounded, but all three survived the war and returned to White Rock to take up where they left off. The Barge brothers opened a hardware and dry goods store where their father's fish shop had been. They were also instrumental in starting the local Great War Veterans Association, 
which later became the Royal Canadian Legion Branch No. 8 in White Rock. Frank Mackenzie, the MLA for the Delta riding, which included White Rock, enlisted while sitting in the legislature. His seat was managed by a colleague until his return. In 1919, the Colombian newspaper reported that he went overseas with the 131st Battalion, but on the breakup of his unit, he was placed on a permanent board of inquiry to investigate all accidents to motor transport vehicles throughout England. Returning home in early 1918, he again took his seat in the legislature. Others from the White Rock area joined forestry battalions, particularly those with experience at the Campbell River Lumber Company mill, which opened just before the war and was in fact saved from bankruptcy by wartime contracts. White Rock resident Gordon Coddington also used his peacetime experience for army employment. He had been a bugler in the White Rock Boy Scouts. When he joined up and went to France in 1917, he was reputed to be the youngest bugler in the Canadian Army. Peace came, and life returned to normal through the roaring 20s and the hard years of the 1930s. But world events led to war once again, and Canada entered the Second World War on September 10, 1939, the same day this photo was taken. It shows Nelson Henry's son, Harold Henry, and his friends on Marine Drive. Soon, many of them would be in uniform, including Harold. Harold joined the RCAF in 1941, was stationed in the UK from 1942 to 1944, and then returned to Canada in 1945. While overseas, Harold met a lovely young lady from Surrey in England. Her name was Joyce, and they were married in December 1943. Joyce actually made it back to White Rock before Harold, along with their baby daughter Norma. Here they are at a welcoming party of the Women's Auxiliary of the local Legion, organized by Eva Henry, Joyce's mother-in-law. After the war, Harold had a long career with Canada Customs stationed at White Rock. Just like the barges a generation before, two generations of Griffiths joined up for the Second World War. Walter, on the right, and his son Eric joined the same artillery unit in 1939. They served in England, Sicily, Italy, France, Holland, and Germany. King George VI inspected their unit in February 1940. Walter was presented to the king. He shook hands with me, said Walter in an interview. He said it was remarkable that I had a son serving in the same battery when I was only 40 years of age, and that he hoped I would be lucky enough to come safely through this war. The king's hopes were realized, and both Griffiths survived the war, and again, like the barges, came home to White Rock and started a landmark business, Midway Motors, which was a mainstay of the White Rock business community until the 1970s. David Charles was the third of 14 children and the oldest son of Chief Bernard Charles Sr. of the Semiamu First Nation. He was still under age when he joined the Canadian Army in the early 40s and went overseas and served in England and France. He survived the war and returned to his large and loving family on the Semiamu Reserve. We don't know much about his military career, though. Like many veterans, he was reluctant to talk about it. The traditional option for women during the First World War was the nursing corps. This is Vivian Yates Haig in 1917. She was a lieutenant nurse in the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps. In the Second World War, women had options to join all branches of the military, namely the Women's Royal Canadian Naval Service, the Canadian Women's Army Corps, and the Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division. As with the men of White Rock, the women seem to have a preference for the Air Force. This is the going-away party for Alice and Phyllis Anthony, who joined the Royal Canadian Air Force Women's Division in 1943. The military wasn't the only option, though, and women joined other organizations for the home front effort. Here are two friends, Kay Hennessy and Vi Wilcox, in Red Cross volunteer uniforms on Marine Drive in White Rock. Early in the war, Alfred Jones of White Rock was aboard HMCS Fraser off the coast of France. 
On the 25th of June, 1940, Fraser and two other ships were returning from Saint-Jean-de-Luz, France, after rescuing refugees fleeing the advancing Germans. Fraser was accidentally rammed by one of the other ships, cutting her in half. She sank immediately, but still, Alfred managed to disarm all the depth charges as the ship sank. Depth charges were armed and ready for instant use at sea. By setting them to safe, he saved many lives. 1941 and 1942 saw many young men from White Rock join the RCAF. The affable and very conversational Don Monroe became a communications specialist and served in the Mediterranean, Far East, and Australia. Before the war, he had been a paperboy. After the war, he became White Rock's postmaster. It seems it was his destiny to communicate with people. Hal and Tom Sinclair, brothers from White Rock, were also in the RCAF as bomber crew. At the end of the war, they were both assigned to ferry bombers across the Atlantic from Europe to Canada. They both returned safely to White Rock and went on to be business leaders in the community with Sinclair Brothers Cement. Hal went into politics and was a White Rock City Councillor from 1970 to 1982. Walter Punch Thompson was a champion athlete and popular in White Rock. He and his mother struggled through the hard times of the Depression, running a small shop on Marine Drive. He joined the RCAF in 1941 and earned his wings as a bomber pilot in March 1942. He was eventually assigned the challenging and dangerous role of Pathfinder and was awarded the DFC twice and flew over 50 missions. Punch survived the war and married an Englishwoman named Eunice. He became a lawyer and lived happily ever after in a beautiful home in Langley. He is also the author of a very fine war memoir titled Lancaster to Berlin. During the Second World War, White Rock was still a small town of less than 1,500 people. Like most small towns, everyone knew each other and most people were friendly and cared for one another. Here we see the going away party for Amerik Vidal in 1942. Amerik and his good friend Renny Dupre both joined the Air Force in 1941 and went over to England in 1942. Amerik as a tail gunner in a Lancaster bomber and Rennie as a Spitfire pilot. Both men sent frequent letters home describing the drudgery or excitement and danger of their military life. Often their letters were published in the local paper for all their friends and neighbors to read. They were both killed within days of each other in 1943. Amrick was shot down over Belgium, this is his war grave there, and Rennie crashed in a training accident near London. You can imagine the grief felt by such a small community for the loss of two young men from local pioneer families. And you can imagine the gratitude and pride felt towards all those who made sacrifices during those difficult years. Gratitude that we still feel today and celebrate every Remembrance Day. Thanks for watching Remembrance Day in White Rock. I'm Hugh Ellenwood, this has been a White Rock Museum and Archives presentation.